Welcome to today's newspaper discussion brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 24-7-2024. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are about to discuss. So without much delay, let's get started. The next article we are going to discuss is going to be entirely about the budget 2025, which mainly focuses on improving the quality of employment, agriculture and MSME by allocating funds to various schemes. With this backdrop, let us see a UPSC mains question with our usual answer writing approach. Let me read out the question for you. Define potential GDP and explain its determinants. What are the factors that have been inhibiting India from realizing its potential GDP? See, it is a previous year question from UPSC mains paper 3. It is a straightforward question asking about the potential and determinants of GDP. And also in the body part, we have to elaborate upon the factors inhibiting India from realizing its potential. So let's start answering. In our introduction part, we have to address what is the potential GDP. Then moving forward, we have to give the various determinants of GDP. So what is a potential GDP? Potential GDP is a theoretical aspect of national income accounting, which assumes that an economy has achieved full employment and that total demand does not exceed total supply, which is very optimistic to be honest. See, it is a maximum level of output that an economy can produce at a constant inflation rate. Let's now see what are the determinants of potential GDP. First one is the labor force. Not just the quantity of labor force, but also the quantity of labor force and the skill power. It also a major factor in determining a GDP of a nation. According to the periodic labor force survey, the labor force participation rate in the urban areas is around only 50.2 percentage according to March 2024. The next one is capital stock. These are the equipment which helps in the production. The availability of capital decides the extent of economic output. It is also one of the major reason why India has high capital to output ratio. The next one is technological advancement. See, advanced and accessibility to technology can improve the growth and the productivity by improving the efficiency of production by reducing the cost and developing its quality. In India, where the R&D percentage is only 0.7 percentage of GDP, according to the economic survey, it is a very bothering scenario to ensure accessibility to the quality technology today. The next major determinant for a GDP is the government intervention. See, several policies and monetary policy particularly will majorly focus on infusing the capital, which will ensure the ease of access to the funds which enable effective productivity in the economy, which is a major driving factor for a GDP of any country. Let's now move on to see the factors inhibiting India from achieving its potential GDP. The first one is huge unemployment. The various employment generation schemes are operational, it is not sufficient to keep up the pace with the glowing job demands. India Employment Report 2024, released by the International Labour Organization and the Institute of Human Development says, India's youth account for almost 83% of unemployed work. And to our surprise, there is an educated unemployment of 70% according to NITI AI. Nextly, there is a huge unorganized sector. The workers in the unorganized sector constitute around 93% of the total workforce of the country. According to the Niti Aayog report of India 75, most of their works goes unaccounted while calculating GDP. Nextly, the poor skilled workforce. See, the unskilled population are the major hurdle to achieving the potential GDP. India's skilled report of 2025 says that only 37.22% of surveyed people were found employable in India. Nextly, the low rate of saving. India has a very low level of investment, which has slowed down the growth of capital stock. According to RBI Bulletin, India's net household financial saving rate has declined to 5.1 percentage of GDP in the year 2022-2023, which is actually the lowest in the decades. And the next most bothering thing is NPA of banks, that is non-performing assets in the bank. Currently, the NPA of the banks are very high, which has reduced the lending capacity of the banks, which in turn affected the productive capacity of the economy, because the bank won't be open to lending any further more capital. With this, we have addressed holistically the body part of this question. Now, moving on, let us conclude. Since the potential GDP measures the actual level of output in the economy, it is very important to address it on a priority basis. To improve the potential GDP, more capital can be injected in the economy by making policy relaxation and addressing the shortcomings in the labor force, like making it more inclusive. If we can address this, India can achieve Vixit Bharat vision of 2047 using its potential GDP. That's all about this discussion. If you have any query with respect to this discussion, please don't hesitate to comment in the comment section or even don't hesitate to watch this video once again. Let's now move on to the next topic. Our next topic is going to be about Olympics 2024. See, usually aspirants might think questions from sports section might not pop up in the UPSC prelims. But to our surprise, the questions recently, especially in the UPSC prelims 2022, questions from cricket, golf, 
tennis and boxing and what not has been asked so please pay attention and let's get into the topic right away let's see what the news actually talks about with the going on war between russia and ukraine the sports persons from russia and belarus were banned from the respective countries in the upcoming paris 2024 olympic games and they are playing only as a neutral individuals and not representing the respective countries similarly banning on israel is being suggested by various stakeholders across the world so that's all the article is all about but let's delve deep into what is more relevant for upsc today so what is olympics See, Olympic is a global sport event that brings together athletes from around the world to compete in various sports and disciplines. It has its origin in the ancient history also. The Olympics originated in the ancient Greek around 776 BC and were held in the honor of Zeus, the king of Greek gods. But there is an historical revival to Olympic Games also because it was revived in the year 1896 in Athens, Greece. Since then, they have been held every four years except during the World War I and World War II. And also during the year of COVID, it has been postponed. So please make a note of it. The motto of Olympic is faster, higher and stronger. Let's now move on to see what the Olympic symbol. It represents the union of five inhabited continents of the world. That is Africa, America, Asia, Europe and Oceania, which is nothing but Australian continent. The five interlocking rings represent the principle of unity and the integration and the international cooperation. It also signifies the coming together of athletes from all corners of the globe in spirit of friendly competition and sportsmanship. Let's now move on to see what is an International Olympic Committee. See, it is a non-governmental organization that looks after the administration of Olympic Games held over the world. It decides the rules and regulations of Olympic Games. It also decides when and where the next Olympic events will be held. The main aim is to ensure regular holding of Olympic Games. The vision of International Olympic Committee is to build a better world through sports. Let's now move on to see the structure of International Olympic Committee. The International Olympic Committee is composed of members who are elected by IOC General Assembly and they will get 8 year term and also they can be re-elected. Moving on, let us see the Olympic Charter. The International Olympic Committee governs the Olympic Games through the Olympic Charter which outlines the rights and the responsibilities of IOC and NOC. Moving on, let us see Paris Olympic 2024. Since this is a Olympic year, the questions from Olympics or any basics from Olympics have a high potential area to be asked in UPSC prelims 2025. So, please pay pinpoint attention. The motto of Paris Olympics 2024 is Games Wide Open, which symbolizes that the game is open for all and aims to cut down the differences among everyone. So, with this, we have come to a holistic understanding about Olympics. So, if you have any doubts, please don't hesitate to watch the video again. Let's now move on to the next topic. Look at this article. Here we are going to discuss about union budget announcement on FDI and overseas investment. So first of all, understand the questions on FDI has been a frequently asked area in UPSC prelim. Recently in 2022 and 2023, questions have been directly asked from FDI. So let's firstly see what the actual announcement is about. The rules and the regulation for the foreign direct investment and the overseas investment will be simplified. This is what the government has been stressing on with this budget. With the main aim is to facilitate the inflow of FDA, to encourage prioritization and to promote the use of Indian rupee for overseas investment. So let's get into see what actually FDA, that is foreign direct investment means. See FDA is something when an investor from one country invests in the business in another country, establishing a lasting interest and a significant degree of influence over these enterprises. See FDA is very crucial for strengthening local industry boosting economic growth and improving global competitiveness. So in simple term, a foreign direct investment is something a investor has a direct control over the company in the native country. So let's see what are the types of FDA and the various routes. The first one is automatic route. In this, no prior approval is needed. Only requires informing the RBI, that is Reserve Bank of India, after the investment. Please make a note, informing RBI only after the investment is made, not before. So, this kind of area, UPSC will stress us on in answering any kind of prelim question. Let's now move on to see what are the sectors where 100% FDI has been allowed in automatic route. It includes agriculture, manufacturing, airports, and e-commerce, pharmaceuticals, and railway infrastructure. Let's now see the government route. It actually requires prior approval from the government of India. It applies to the sectors such as defense, where the investment is beyond 49% and telecom beyond 49% and print media beyond 26%. Let's now move on to see what are the required security clearances for investing in FDI. It is actually required for specific sectors like broadcasting, defense, 
and private security civil aviation and mining it is actually managed by the ministry of home affairs and the ministry of external affairs see here one could easily get confused with ministry of finance so please make a note it is under ministry of home affairs and ministry of external affairs who actually manages the security clearance with respect to fdi in india Let's now see the trends in the current FDI inflow. FDI equity inflows in India have decreased to a five-year low in 2024 financial year. High inflation and big demand in US and Europe have made India less attractive to the investors. India's non-participation in agreement like RCEP, that is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, where a comprehensive free trade agreement which is being negotiated between 10 Asian member states and Asian free trade agreement partners that is Australia, China, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. And also know that investments from China still go through government route due to security consideration. This has greatly reduced the inflow of FDI particularly from China. So let's see what can we do with respect to FDI in India. In 2024 economic survey, it suggests promoting FDI from China to benefit the manufacturing sectors and enhance export markets because many raw materials has been sourced from China, particularly in pharmaceutical industry where the import from China is more than 60%. Please make a note of it. Secondly, easing the norms for FDI can also increase inflow in India, can also increase the inflow of FDI into India. The government is working on Jan Viswas Bill 2.0 to enhance the ease of doing business. So you can use these kinds of statements in your mains introduction and even in the conclusion part also. And more importantly, recently the center have also announced that states will be incentivized for implementing business reforms, action plans and digitalization which give real boost to attract FDI into India. So with this, we have covered FDI in a holistic manner. Like as I have mentioned before, FDI is a very very important area particularly for prelims. So Please make a note of it and if you have any doubts in regard to FDI, please don't hesitate to watch this video again. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is going to be about equalization leeway. See, a question on equalization leeway has already been asked in UPSC prelims 2018 and it is also an evolving topic and it's more relevant today. So, it is a probably a potential area for UPSC prelims 2025. So, please pay attention. Let's start with the understanding of equalization leeway. More precisely, Equalization Leeway 1.0, that is Google Tax, which is colloquially being said. See, it was actually started in 2016 as withholding tax. It applies only to services and it is a part of Finance Act 2016 and not an amendment to an Income Tax Act of 1961. Please make a note of it. It is charged at a rate of 6% on the payment for a specified services received by a non-resident from an Indian resident or a non-resident with a permanent establishment in India. See, these kinds of area, only the questions and the data will be manipulated and asked as an option in UPSC prelims. So, please ensure that you are having a holistic understanding about equalization leeway. So, let's now see what is actually the equalization leeway 2.0 is about, which is also known as Amazon tax. See, it is actually introduced in 2020 and it directly targets on non-residents. It actually applies to e-commerce supplies or services. It is introduced as an amendment to the Finance Act of 2016. The rate of charge is around 2% on the tax on payments received by the non-residents e-commerce operators for the service provided to an Indian resident. A non-resident or anyone using an internet protocol address located in India. It applies to e-commerce operators with annual sales turnover or the gross receipts exceeding 20 million rupees. And also know that India was one of the first country in the world to introduce 6% of equalization levy in 2016. But the levy was restricted to online advertisement services, commonly known as digital advertising tax or DATs. In March 2020, it expanded the scope of the existing equalization levy to a range of digital services that includes e-commerce platforms. Any payment made by a non-resident in connection with an Indian user will now attract 2% levy. This is actually called as Digital Service Tax or DST. Let's now see the evolution of India's Digital Service Tax in brief. See, in 2016, the Akhilesh Ranjan Committee suggested creating a level playing field between online and a physical business in India. India introduced the equalization levy on advertising services at 6% with this backdrop. Then in 2018, India included the term significant economic presence in the Income Tax Act, which allowing the taxation of the companies with a significant user base in India. Then in 2020, the equalization levy was expanded to cover e-commerce, which is prevalent today. But there are several questions being raised and also being criticized. One of the most important question is that 
whether the DST implemented by India is discriminate. Let's see from the US perspective because it mainly affects non-resident companies, many of which are US based. But in reality, India's threshold for the equalization levy is lower than what European Union envisions. The levy aims to create a fairness between digital and physical business. With this, we have covered this article holistically. Have a firm grip over this topic like this, which comes very handy in UPSC prelims and also in mains. So with this discussion, let us move on to our next topic. Our next article is going to cover about the budgetary allocation specifically for social sector. It is being said, despite focusing on youth, farmers, women and the poor, the budget 2024 allocation for the social sector haven't been significantly increased. So let us see what the disappointment is all about. Firstly, with respect to education, the allocation for the school education has increased by 5000 crore and for higher education by 3000 crore. However, however, the expected recoveries are higher, indicating an increase in the fees and self-financing schemes. Nextly, with respect to health sector, the Department of Health and Family Welfare's budget has increased by a mere 1,500 crore compared to the last year. So, the issue of out-of-packet expenditure will prevail. Nextly, with respect to Mandrega, the allocation remains the same as per the last year revised estimates, limiting the availability of work based on the budget. Moving on, let us see with respect to certain schemes. Firstly, with regard to food subsidy, despite needing to cover the current population levels and the rising cost, there is hardly an increase in the food subsidy budget. Then with respect to the Poshan scheme, which majorly focuses on to reduce malnutrition, shunting and anemia among children, pregnant women and lactating mothers through the nutrition intervention and awareness. The budget has been slightly increased to 12,467 crore, still less than the actual expenditure in the year 2022-2023. Then, with respect to Saksham Anganwadi scheme, which is a flagship program by the Indian government aimed at strengthening and revitalizing Anganwadi centers, which provide essential services like nutrition, healthcare and early childhood education to the children and women. The allocation increased to 21,000 crore from 20,554 crore. Then with respect to Samatya scheme, the budget allocation was reduced to 2,517 crore, which has been remained unchanged since 2017. See, the Samatya scheme is majorly focusing on skill training and employment opportunities to the persons with disability, aiming to promote inclusivity and empowerment. It offers training, mentorship and job placement support to enhance the employability and independence among the physically challenged persons. Then, with respect to National Social Assistance Program, the budget remains unchanged at 9,652 crores since 2009. It is a program actually providing financial assistance to the vulnerable section like old age pensioners, pensioned widows, disabled persons and it also covers national family benefit schemes which actually aims to promote social justice and welfare in the society. Moving forward, there is also a concern regarding the shift in the government focus because the government is moving towards a contributionary schemes like Atal Pension Yojana and there is a shift towards privatization and commercialization in health and education respectively. The focus is on cost effectiveness in social spending, potentially ignoring the long-term human development benefits and equity considerations. So, in the summary, the budget 2024 shows minor increase in the allocations for education and health with a noticeable shift towards higher fees and privatization. Though the social schemes see a slight increase but remains inefficient to meet the needs or to adjust for inflation. The heavy reliance on the private sector to boost employment raises concerns about the effectiveness of the current package. Overall, the approach prioritizes market principles and cost effectiveness in the social spending, potentially neglecting the needs of vulnerable population and equitable development. That's all about this topic. With this, we have come to the end of our first section and let's move on to our second section that is Prince practice question for the day. Look at our first question. With reference to India's decision to levy an equalization tax of 6% on online advertisement services offered by the non-resident entities, which of the following statement is or correct? It introduced as a part of Income Tax Act. Non-resident entities that offer advertisement services in India can claim a tax credit in their home country under the Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement. Select the correct answer using the code given below. One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. The correct answer is D. See, the statement one is not correct because equalization levy is a tax on business taxation for online marketing in which any company pays a sum of more than one lakh to non-resident entities such as Google and Facebook etc. It is actually the part of Finance Act, not the Income Tax Act. And the statement 2 is also not correct. Since equalization levy is outside the scope of tax treaties, 
entered by India with other countries. The foreign companies cannot claim a tax credit in its home country. With this, let's move to our next question. Look at the second question with reference to foreign direct investment in India. Which one of the following is considered as its major characteristics? Option A. It is an investment through the capital instruments, especially in a listed company. Option B. It is largely non-debt creating capital flow. Option C. It is the investment that involves debt servicing. Option D. It is the instrument made by foreign institutional investors in the government securities. The correct answer is option B. It is largely a non-debt creating capital flow. Option A is not correct because the foreign direct investment is the investment through the capital instruments by the person resident outside India in an unlisted Indian company or 10% or more of the post issue paid up equity capital on a fully diluted basis of an listed Indian company. Option C is not correct because the capital invested in India via FTI is non-debt creating and not allowed to serve debt. Option D is not correct because an investment is called foreign portfolio investment if the investment made by a person or an institutional investor resident outside India in a capital instruments that is less than 10% of the post issue paid up equity capital on a fully diluted basis of a listed Indian company or less than 10% of a paid up value of each series of capital instruments of a listed Indian company. That's all about this question. Let's move on to our next question for the day. Look at the third question. Consider the following statement regarding Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act that is Mandrega scheme. The Mandrega is a supply-led scheme guaranteeing at least 100 days of unskilled work at any rural household that wants it. If the work is not provided within 15 days, applicants are entitled to an unemployment allowance. In the last two years, more than half of the states or union territories have underutilized their allocated funds under Mandrega. Which of the statement above is or correct? Option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 2 only. Option C, 2 and 3 only. Option D, all the above. The correct answer is option B, 2 only. That's all for today's discussion. If you like this video, please hit like, share and comment. Thank you.